All right. So it's um, just past 10 a.m. on Thursday, August 4th. And uh, welcome to uh, the uh, Bamba model of happiness at work. As I mentioned in my email, um, you will find this lecture to be useful when you participate in the happiness simulation that's coming up on April 10th, uh, about a week from today. So let me start by giving you a little bit of an overview of uh, what's coming up in that session. Um, so let's see here. Yeah. So um, this happiness simulation will take place during regular class time. It will be an in-person uh, session. So between 12.30 and 1.45 p.m. at our regular meeting place, which is, I believe, RRH 3.402 or something. Um, in terms of the session agenda and setup, um, the simulation itself will take the bulk of class, maybe about 45, 40, 45 minutes. Uh, preceding it will be a 10, 15 minute intro to the simulation and setup so that you understand the rules of the game um, and um, uh, what the objective is and so on. And then you participate in the simulation. And then uh, I do want to mention here, by the way, that you will be doing it with your teammates, um, the same teammates that you have for your final project. Um, and then um, you will, uh, there will be a debrief at the end where you get to um, see uh, what, how you could have done better, what the lessons learned are, and so on. Um, I do want to um, remind everyone to please pay up um, by this weekend. I will send out another uh, email reminder as well about this um, soon. Um, and after you do that, or before you do that, uh, watch this uh, video lecture on the Bamba model. Um, the uh, overall idea of the simulation is uh, to give you a uh, understanding of um, how some of the concepts that we have covered in class apply to the context of organizations. So we've already begun um, talking about, um, we, we, sorry, we began the course really in the, in the first couple of sessions talking about this concept, concept of functionality of happiness, this idea that happiness is not just um, a uh, desirable thing in terms of um, uh, a, a feeling good when we're happy, right? Um, it is also uh, a useful thing. So people who are happy tend to be healthier. People who are happy tend to be better in teams. People who are happy tend to be more creative, more objective. So unsurprisingly, organizations that are happy tend to be more uh, productive and profitable. Um, on average, they tend to be about 10% more profitable than comparable organizations that have employees that are not as happy. Uh, this is because uh, happier employees are more satisfied, they are more engaged in the job, they enjoy a higher morale, uh, there's a greater level of camaraderie among the employees in the organization and so on. And so all of those in turn end up leading to higher productivity and profits. Um, and uh, just as background information, we've already done some of these scales. And so uh, this should be familiar to you. Um, we can measure all of these things, right? We can measure happiness at work for the employees, um, just as we measured it for you in one of the early classes. We can also measure engagement at work. Um, so these might be some of the items that one uses to measure engagement. We can also measure productivity at work. Um, and you know, productivity might come in you know, subjective uh, flavor as well as objective. So this is more of a subjective um, assessment of um, productivity, how productive an employee feels he or she is. But uh, we could also ask the organization how productive they are, right? Um, uh, how much they've contributed to a team project. For example, you can ask the manager to report the productivity of an employee. So whichever method we use to assess productivity, uh, the basic finding is that happier employees tend to be more productive. Um, and that's because they enjoy higher levels of engagement, higher levels of satisfaction in the job, and higher levels of morale. And um, I have in some previous sessions, or, or I, should, I should say in some previous years, assessed um, all of these things for students uh, in my MBA program at, the, at McCombs and um, verified that this is in fact true for the students at McCombs too. So the happier the students were, them, I asked them to think back to the time when they were working and all MBAs have some work experience at least. 
So uh, I asked them to recall when they were working, how happy they were, how productive they were, and how much um, satisfaction, engagement, and morale uh, the uh, recall experiencing. And um, this is a very uh, robust finding and replicatable finding. Basically, what I find is that the happier the students reported being at work, the more productive they also reported being at work. And that productivity in turn was, um, technically speaking, we use the term mediated. Um, that is that the reason why happier employees are more productive is because they are more satisfied, more engaged, and enjoy higher morale. Um, so in other words, if you put uh, satisfaction, engagement, and morale in the regression equation, then the effect of happiness at work on productivity kind of becomes non-significant. In other words, the, re the only reason um, happier uh, employees are more productive is because they enjoy higher satisfaction, engagement, and morale. So uh, happiness by itself doesn't have a direct effect on productivity and profits above and beyond uh, increasing satisfaction engagement and morale. Uh, all of this to say that it's very important for managers to um, prioritize happiness of employees at work, um, obviously prioritize their own happiness as well. But in this happiness simulation, we're going to take the perspective of a manager who's interested in uh, increasing the happiness of his team uh, and his teammates um, uh, and his co-workers, the people who are reporting to him or her. Um, so this then leads to the question, what are the determinants of happiness uh, in the workplace? And this is where the Bamba model comes into the picture. Um, as the uh, word Bamba, uh, you can see here it on the screen. Um, as you can see, uh, the word Bamba has five letters, um, B-A-M-B-A, -B -A, and each of these is a determinant of happiness in the workplace. So we start with basic needs. Obviously, you're not going to be happy if your basic needs are not met. If you do not know where your next um, meal is going to come from, if you cannot pay your bills, etc. So, uh, if firms need to um, pay enough money, uh, you know, at a very basic level, to their employees in order for the employees to report a high level of happiness, goes without saying. Uh, autonomy is important too, um, uh, and uh, the third determinant is mastery. And see, uh, if you look at each of these. Uh, words or determinants of happiness, if you look at the first letter of each of these, uh, B-A-M, um, that forms the Bamba model. So belonging comes forth and um, last but not least is abundance culture. So uh, what I'm going to do is in the rest of this session, I'm going to um, provide a little bit of an overview of what each of these uh, five determinants are. Um, and um, then talk a little bit about what um, you as a manager, if you take the role of a manager or wear the hat of a manager, what you could do in order to promote happiness um, at work uh, through each of these five determinants. Some things that you could do at work in order to increase the happiness of your employees uh, that have to do with each of these five determinants. So let's start with basic needs. So the approach that I'm going to take uh, is that... Um, each of these um, five determinants of happiness um, are um, going to be operating in a workplace through what I'm going to call domains. Uh, and so when you take basic needs, uh, we have physical basic needs that have to do with our safety and comfort and health. So physical basic needs would be a domain of basic needs and a subdomain of physical basic needs would be safety. Um, another subdomain would be comfort. So you're going to see this general template across all of the five determinants um, of happiness in the workplace um, uh, in the presentation. You're going to see it soon. Okay, so uh, if you think about um, physical basic needs, right? I've talked about safety and comfort and health. Obviously, your employees are not going to be happy if they're not, say, comfortable in the workplace, right? This might have to do with uh, the... Um, uh, the cubicle in which they work or the seat that they occupy, the desk that they occupy, uh, et cetera, are relatively comfortable. Um, and uh, if any of you have experienced uh, being at work where it's not comfortable um, and um, it's not ergonomically designed, for example, and you end up with, say, a backache or a shoulder ache, et cetera, or carpal tunnel syndrome, that's not good for happiness, right? Um, so again, I mean, these are relatively basic um, and I imagine that most of us uh, probably don't um, uh, have such problems, uh, basic problems. And um, so I'm going to be focusing mostly on the rest of the 
or determinants of happiness in the presentation, but I do want to point out that basic needs are important too. And not only do we have physical basic needs, we also have emotional basic needs. Emotional basic needs mostly have to do with how um, other people treat us. Um, do our bosses trust us, for example? Do our peers like us? Uh, do our direct reports um, respect us? Uh, that becomes important. And um, then finally, mental basic needs, in particular fairness, for example, right? So if you feel like you're not being paid as much as a colleague is, even though both of you are doing um, exactly the same thing or more or less the same thing, um, then you might not be very happy because you feel that the income that you're earning is not fair. It's unfairly low. So um, these are uh, the basic needs at work. Um, and you'll see in the simulation that um, some of the characters that are reporting to you uh, might suffer from lack of basic needs and um, therefore they are unhappy. And so you're going to have to figure out um, which set of basic needs are lacking for this particular person. Maybe it's income fairness or maybe it is that they don't have role clarity on what it is that they're being evaluated at uh, the end of the year um, uh, appraisals. Uh, and therefore, you're going to have to take action in order to correct for that. So that's how the simulation is going to work. Uh, but uh, let me move on to now talking about the second um, determinant in the Bamba model, which is autonomy. Autonomy has to do with uh, having a sense of control, um, having a sense of say in the organization. And if you look at this domains and subdomains of autonomy figure, uh, you see here that there is um, a, a uh, domain of autonomy that I call personal autonomy. So do you feel a sense of autonomy when it comes to uh, the people in the organization? Do you have your boss's support, for example? Do you have the sense um, that people have researched a lot called voice? Voice has to do with you feeling that um, you can express and air or share your opinions. Uh, your honest opinions about things and the way things are done in the organization without fearing a backlash from the people in the organization, particularly your leaders. Um, likewise, uh, do you feel that you can bring your full self to work, right? And I'll talk a little bit about this uh, when we talk about some of the ways in which we could improve autonomy. Um, a second domain of autonomy is outcomes. Do you feel that um, you have had a say in the set of tasks that have been assigned to you? Do you have a sense of goal ownership? Um, so for example, I teach at the McComb School of Business, right? And uh, if I do not have a say in the courses that I'm assigned and I'm being asked to teach courses that I don't feel um, a, set of, a sense of connection with, or I, I don't feel um, that I have the interest in teaching these courses, then obviously I'm not going to be happy, right? So not only do I need to have a um, sense that I have some ownership over the goals, I need to have clarity on what those goals are, but also get training and resources in order to do that course well. So if I'm being given a new course, asked to teach a new course, right? Um, and hopefully it's a course that I myself want to teach as well. Uh, but if I want to um, prep for the course and you know want to sit in on another uh, professor teaching the same course, let's say at Harvard, right? Will I be given the resources in order to be able to do it? You know, maybe to travel to Harvard every uh, second week in order to sit in on that course, um, or at the very least, um, uh, take a online course uh, that that professor is offering, which might cost some money uh, in order to take that course. So that's outcomes autonomy. Do I have um, some level of say in the outcomes um, that I'm being? Uh, asked to achieve on behalf of the organization. And of course, process autonomy, which is probably one of the more important domains of autonomy, uh, which has to do with um, uh, how I am asked to achieve my goal. Um, is it, am I being restricted? Uh, so could I work from um, home? Okay, so process autonomy has to do with not just how, but also with when and where. Um, do I have some say in the times um, uh, during which I work? Uh, and this has become hugely important, particularly after COVID, right? Because uh, working from home um, really got a big boost during COVID. And um, now people are kind of used to that. They probably have, most of us have a home office. And so um, we have the kind of um, set up in order to work from home. And we also probably have um, a, uh, a set of, you know, uh, a, 
not just the setup, but we also have the desire to work from home. We don't do not want to commute, for example, as much, etc. So um, all of these domains of autonomy are important. And one of the things that's been discovered in uh, in the uh, you know current post COVID era is that uh, most organizations are favoring what's called a hybrid uh, mode of working, right? So uh, you could work uh, from home for some of the days of the week and then come into the office some of the days of the week because there are some advantages to coming in. But do you as an employee feel that you have some say in uh, which days you come in? Or um, do you have some say in the um, uh, uh, type of hybrid uh, uh, model that your organization has chosen, which particular days you come into work and so on. Okay, so that's got to do with autonomy. And so uh, you can kind of think about some of the things that you could do for your coworkers in order to increase the sense of autonomy, right? So one of the things that you could do is that you encourage everyone to bring their whole self to work. Um, many of us feel that um, we only bring a certain more analytical side to us, uh, of us to work, or more uh, the professional side. We can't really be uh, fun oriented or share our hobbies. Um, we uh, might feel a little bit uncomfortable talking about perhaps um, our religion and uh, things like that. And the um, uh, idea here is to encourage people to um, not feel that sense of discomfort, right? To encourage people to share who they are uh, at work. And so, uh, one thing you could do is to hold these so-called shine your light events where uh, employees are encouraged to um, share some personal interest of theirs um, uh, during these sessions. So it could happen, uh, say, on, on Fridays um, uh, during lunch, uh, uh, an hour or something is blocked and the whole team congregates for lunch. And then one of the team members goes up and then makes a presentation about something that they're truly deeply interested in. Maybe it's photography, right? Maybe it's that they're into skiing or scuba diving, some hobby of theirs, or maybe they are uh, from a particular region in the world and they share a little bit about um, that part of the world and uh, features of that part of the world, you know, the food, the culture, the people, and so on. Another thing along similar lines is to encourage employees to personalize their space at work, right? So some organizations like Etsy and Netflix and Southwest Airlines uh, even give employees a little bit of a budget. It's not a big amount, it's maybe $100, but uh, it's more symbolic, but it goes a long way in um, making, the, uh, making the employees feel that the organization cares for um, uh, who they are as human beings, you know? Um, uh, beyond just their uniform or what roles they play in the organization, uh, the employee cares for uh, uh, what makes them who they are, right? So um, the, this small budget that, say, Etsy gives in order to personalize their space, it's about $100, not a lot of money, but um, it uh, provides the um, encouragement uh, to the employees to display their you know, pictures of their family, perhaps, or a poster that really... Um, you know, uh, motivated them or a quote um, on the poster that uh, they, they really believe in. So it kind of signals to the rest of the people in the organization who they are at a deeper level. And that gives them this sense of autonomy. So you can do that. You can also help employees understand what they need to do in order to gain autonomy or authority, right? So autonomy is uh, obviously something that people seek, but it's not necessarily something that everyone has earned. And so the idea here is to communicate to the organization. The leaders need to communicate to the organ to the to the people in the organization what they need to do in order to gain this sense of autonomy or authority. Uh, the gentleman you see on the screen here, his name is Sunny Singh. I interviewed him um, on this topic about five years ago. Uh, he is uh, CEO of a um, backend uh, kind of record keeping company called Edifex, based in Seattle. And Edifex um, customers tend to be um, hospitals and things like that. So they keep a lot of records, um, medical records of the patients. And what Sunny does is that he meets with every employee um, uh, very often, once a month for about half an hour. Um, each of the people reporting to him, he has about 12 people reporting to him. And each of those 12 obviously will have other people reporting to them and so on. So the culture of the organization is such that they meet uh, whoever reports to them about um, um, you know, once a month for about half an hour. And during that uh, meeting, uh, they discuss informal things. Um, they don't necessarily wait until the 
uh, year end um, in order to uh, meet with these employees. And uh, even though these half an hour meetings are informal, obviously there is some level of work discussed, um, you know, some check-ins on how things are going, how things could improve. And so there is an opportunity for the leaders um, to uh, guide and nurture the people reporting to them, but also provide and also get feedback from these people uh, on what it is that could be improved. And so this kind of regular check-in as opposed to um, a check-in that happens in a big way at the end of the year um, allows leaders uh, the opportunity in the forum to um, tell the employees uh, reporting to them what it is that they need to do in order to earn this autonomy. And one of the things that might come out from this is that, um, uh, you know, let's set up a, a weekly meeting at 9 a.m., say on Monday. And in the meeting, uh, we are going to go over what the goals were for the week, last week, and which of the goals got achieved, which didn't, um, and why it is that some of these goals may not have been achieved and what we can do in order to bridge the gap between where we wanted to be and where we are, that kind of a thing. Okay, so um, the last thing that you could do, uh, of course you can do many, many things, but I only want to talk about three things that you can do for each of these five determinants, Bamba determinants of happiness at work. So the last thing that um, I'm going to talk about that one can do is to give employees back their personal time, right? So this is huge in, the, in this day and age uh, because, um, you know, if you rewind back about 40 years, uh, you know, employees finished work at say 5 p.m., um, checked out of uh, office and went home and watched TV, hung out with their um, kids, their family, uh, friends. Um, and then on the weekends, you know, maybe played ball, et cetera. Uh, it was difficult to get in touch with uh, your coworkers uh, because we didn't have email, we didn't have smartphones, uh, et cetera. Now, you know, the situation is entirely different, right? So um, we constantly uh, are contactable uh, by people who want to contact us through all of these devices and because we are contactable and because we know we are contactable we have this pressure to kind of uh, also check in uh, on a regular basis to see if somebody's contacted us so what that's meant is that the boundary that was a little bit sh a little sharper uh, earlier uh, say four decades ago between work and um, your personal life uh, is is now much more porous and and there is a lot more more of uh, kind of a flow over, so to speak, of uh, work-related concerns and things like that into our personal time, which obviously impinges on our uh, level of autonomy. So the idea here is to give back the employees uh, the sense of control and autonomy that they had over their free time, um, including weekends, uh, but also uh, the evenings after work is over. So uh, a couple of um, countries have actually taken this to heart. France and Germany come to mind where uh, if you're an organization with over 100 employees, uh, you cannot, as a rule of law, contact your employees during the weekends and uh, after work uh, time is over during the day. And um, this is obviously given these employees a lot more autonomy over their time. Um, some economists were worried that this might actually have lowered the productivity of these countries and these organizations. But in fact, if anything, the productivity has gone up a little bit. And it makes sense if you kind of like think back, uh, think about it a little bit. Um, when you have a clearer demarcation of when work ends and when your personal time begins, um, then uh, chances are that you're going to be more relaxed, more um, uh, calm or you know not as stressed and you're going to be able to sleep better and you're going to come back to work a little more refreshed and probably be a little more efficient when you are at work. And uh, that's in fact what's been found in some of the research. Uh, another thing along similar lines is uh, maybe this is a little bit of a um, uh, uh, controversial idea is, is to force people to take vacations, right? So some organizations, I, I mentioned Netflix earlier about uh, in the context of personalizing your space, they give you a little bit of a budget to do it. Uh, but they also have this idea that, you know, you can take as many vacations as you want, whenever you want, et cetera. But in fact, nobody takes those vacations, right? Because everyone's afraid that everyone else is going to be noticing how much vacation I take. And that's going to impact how I'm evaluated and my prospects in the organization and so on. And so the, here the idea is that um, you take this um, out of the employee's hands uh, in the sense that you force everyone to take vacations and they have to take vacations. Um, 
Uh, and there is an organization in Denver called Simplify, which uh, uh, basically tracked what happened to the productivity and creativity of the ideas that the employees came up with uh, after they uh, implemented this uh, forced vacation um, uh, policy. And what they found is that uh, when they had the policy where people, uh, the employees were forced to take a vacation and they had to um, uh, prove that uh, they actually went on vacation and that they did not check email or any of the work, did not contact any anybody from work. That was an important stipulation. Uh, only then did they get an extra bonus of about $5,000 um, uh, for going on vacation, right? So that, uh, makes it much easier for the employees now to um, actually take a vacation and um, rejuvenate, right? And uh, refresh themselves before they come back to work. Uh, and it gives, as you can imagine, it gives the employees a huge sense of, you know, this organization truly cares for me and you get a sense of autonomy over your free time. All right, so we've covered basic needs and autonomy. I want to talk a little bit about mastery now, um, and then we'll talk about belonging and abundance culture. Here's the uh, figure of the domains and subdomains of mastery. Um, in my uh, interviews with lots of organizations um, over, you know, I would say 20 organizations around the world, uh, when I talk about the BAMBA model, um, they can easily relate to the importance of basic needs and autonomy. And later I'm going to talk about belonging and culture. Uh, all of those they can relate to. One of the things that organizations, most organizations, even though after I mentioned mastery, they're able to see how it's an important part of the jigsaw puzzle of happiness at work, uh, they don't proactively think about this particular um, determinant of happiness at work. Um, and what mastery refers to is uh, this desire that most of us have. I would say that, in fact, all of us have, um, but perhaps this is one of those domains or determinants where there is a huge variance in the level to which people desire this um, in, uh, in order to promote their happiness, uh, is that we have a desire to become increasingly good or better at what we do, right? We want to acquire skills. Uh, we want to be perceived as competent. We, in fact, want to be competent, uh, particularly in the job that we do, uh, but even learn things that perhaps don't directly relate to our job, right? So there's an element of what... Um, I'm going to call skills mastery. This has to do with your with our core job skills. Um, those core job skills are very, very important in the particularly in the first half of our career. So if you think about a typical career that lasts about 30 to 40 years, let's say 35 years on average, the first about 15 to 20 years, your chances of being promoted and what you're evaluated on is going to be um, more dependent on your core job skills. So if you're a brand manager on your ability to manage the brand, right? If you are a um, um, you know IT personnel guy, then uh, um, or a woman, you're going to be evaluated on IT skills. But the second half of your career, it turns out, um, where you're now in the management role, uh, your chances uh, of getting promoted, etc., are going to be dependent much more on your um, people skills and uh, other soft skills. Um, so your ability to make presentations, for example, and things like that. Um, and so um, those set of skills that you see in the middle um, of this figure uh, are skills that we are all kind of quite aware of, even though we may not be aware that core job skills recede in terms of importance as we rise up the hierarchy and the softer skills, people skills, and other soft skills um, kind of become more important. Um, but it is also uh, important to, I think, acknowledge and um, recognize that there are two other domains of um, uh, skills or, or mastery, I should say, that are super important for um, being happy at work. One of those is uh, personal mastery. So mastery over ourselves, uh, our own behaviors, and in particular, our feelings, because emotions are super important to us, right? Which is why we're talking about happiness to begin with. Um, and uh, feelings and emotions drive uh, the way we think, what we think, and also drive our behavior. There's a very strong connection between emotions and those two aspects of our um, of our personality and um, kind of what we do and how we think, right? So um, it's important to kind of um, recognize uh, that personal mastery is uh, hugely um, uh, important for our happiness. Um, and I've talked about this quite a bit in the course, of course, uh, uh, when I talked about internal control, right? Internal control is about taking this personal mastery. Um, but there's another domain of mastery that's also important, which has to do with self-awareness. 
Um, we didn't spend a whole lot of time in the course talking about it, but all of us have uh, certain values, certain desires, certain, certain ways in which we want to grow, uh, certain ways in which we want to contribute to society. Uh, the way in which um, we uh, kind of encountered these ideas is uh, through that, uh, you know, three most important questions um, video that I sent out to you all, where I asked you to um, uh, uh, take out a sheet of paper, or rather the guy that uh, was in the video asks you to take a sheet of paper and write about the set of experiences that you want to have um, before, um, as he puts it, you kick kick the bucket, right? Um, so what do you want to experience? So you, do you want to um, uh, climb Mount Kilimanjaro, for example, right? Or do you want to experience going to um, a hundred countries? Uh, you want to travel to a lot of places. So what set of experiences do you want to have? How do you want to grow? What do you want to learn, right? And that has to do with your purpose as uh, we have defined uh, purpose in this course. Uh, which has to do with things that are intrinsically motivating for you. Uh, you would do even if you're not paid any money. Do you want to learn to play the guitar, for example, or become really good at mindfulness, right? And then the third um, aspect of self-awareness um, mastery is uh, contribution and meaning. Um, how do you want to be an agent of positive change in this world? Um, do you want to um, support your... Um, uh, you know, a group of people that have share certain interests with you or certain hobbies with you? Do you want to contribute to your church, for example, if you're part of a church, right? Uh, obviously, most of us will want to contribute to our own family. Um, perhaps we want to contribute to our country, right? Uh, or where we come from, the little village that we might have come uh, come from originally, uh, etc. So um, all of these domains are very important. Um, and uh, the idea here is uh, that as a leader, uh, if you're aware uh, of the ways in which a person reporting to you um, wants to grow, um, you know, the ways in which they want to grow in terms of their skills, uh, the ways in which they want to uh, grow in terms of um, checking off uh, the set of things that they want to experience uh, or want to learn and how they want to contribute, then you're going to increase their happiness levels. So um, the three things that you can do for your coworkers, uh, one of the things that uh, we often do in these yearly uh, appraisals, the year-end appraisals. I already talked a little bit about this, right? So uh, we tend to, uh, as leaders, evaluate how well somebody did compared to how well they were supposed to do, uh, whether they achieved the set of objectives and goals that we had set for them or the organization had set for them. Um, uh, on top of that, uh, I, I think these um, conversations that we have with our um, direct reports are also an opportunity to provide resources for training and education, right? So you can use these um, year-end appraisal um, uh, uh, events uh, as an opportunity to assess the ways in which the uh, direct reports uh, or, or your coworkers want to grow and learn. Um, and uh, you might discover that um, they're in the wrong place, right? Uh, in the year-end appraisal, if you explicitly ask them, where do you see yourself two years from now, five years from now, you might be talking to somebody who's in the back end, but they have aspirations to be um, in um, marketing, you know, which is more front-facing uh, in five years from now. So uh, the idea then is to provide resources and training and education to them. Uh, if you also as a leader feel that that um, is an appropriate aim for them or an objective, uh, that you think is realistic, given your assessment of their talents or uh, background and uh, experience, et cetera, then to provide that training and education. And a lot of organizations these days um, actually provide this, um, you know, set of tools or training um, that um, uh, employees in any organization can take advantage of. You know, LinkedIn has courses on mindfulness, for example. Uh, many of you uh, will be aware of Coursera, which is a uh, MOOC platform. MOOC is M-O-O-C, Massive Open Online Course. Um, and um, as an organization, it's far uh, less expensive these days to um, give your employees access to um, uh, courses like the courses on Coursera. Uh, you know, if somebody wanted to learn programming, uh, say, 20 years ago, uh, they would have to go and enroll in a university or take a workshop outside, um, would probably have been in person and would have cost thousands of dollars. And now um, many of these, um, you know, pieces of information and uh, these courses are uh, available, if not for free, then 
at least for you know a very low amounts of money. Um, so maybe in in a couple of hundred dollars on Coursera. Um, the second thing that you can do uh, is, uh, oh, by the way, you know, providing resources for training. Uh, one of the ways in which Google uh, kind of subtly nudges people uh, to um, constantly be uh, learning and upskill is by placing resources like books in restrooms. Um, so this is a picture of a restroom in uh, Google in New York. And you can see here that um, there are quite a few books out there um, on, on a variety of topics. And so, you know, as you go visit the restroom, you might pick up a book and then, uh, you know, depending on your interest, um, learn a little bit about it. That might come in handy. Or at the very least, what Google is doing is uh, conveying to people that, look, you know, this is a culture in which uh, we constantly want to encourage people to keep their eyes open and um, pick up bits and pieces of knowledge as they go along uh, in, in the day, right? And that might come in um, handy and useful in ways that you, you may not be able to imagine and, and predict. So that's the idea. All right, uh, so the third thing that you can do, and this is a little bit of a um, off the wall uh, idea, um, and this is to encourage the pursuit of hobbies. Um, so if you, you've encouraged uh, your employees to uh, shine their light and share their um, full self at work, you might discover that somebody is into origami or somebody else is into flying drones, right? Uh, people have all kinds of hobbies outside of work. And the idea here is, can we as an organization encourage them to pursue these hobbies? And you might think that, why would this be useful in terms of acquiring skills? It turns out though, um, you know, even though it might seem at a very um, kind of first blush intuitive level that uh, spending time pursuing a hobby is gonna take time away from devoting to uh, your core job skills. Um, or soft skills. In fact, uh, the pursuit of hobbies makes you more likely that you're going to be better at your job. Um, so for example, uh, Nobel Prize winners are about two times uh, or three times actually more likely than the average scientist to have uh, a hobby. Okay. And Nobel Prize winners, right? I mean, these are guys who are kind of, we think of them as unidimensional. They only spend time doing this one thing and they're really, really good at it. That's why they won the Nobel Prize, right? They don't have the bandwidth to do anything else. But in fact, um, they tend to have uh, a higher chance of uh, pursuing a arts and crafts hobby, uh, especially compared to an average scientist. So, uh, and, the, and the reason for this is, uh, you know, got to do with cross-pollination. So the way in which our brain works and how creative ideas come about is when we um, see some stimuli, stimuli in one domain, and that's a completely, you know, unrelated domain to the primary domain in which we work, but we may be able to apply ideas from that unrelated domain to this other domain. You know, um, uh, Einstein very famously, um, came up with a lot of his ideas while, while working as a um, patent office clerk, right? Uh, in, in Bern in Switzerland, which had nothing to do with theoretical physics. Um, but nevertheless, um, that experience of being a patent office clerk and him having a lot of free time to do other things, including playing the violin, um, uh, served to um, you know, cross pollinate his work um, in, in terms of theoretical physics. Okay, so um, so I've talked about basic needs, autonomy, mastery, and let's talk about belonging a little bit, um, which is one of my favorite topics. Uh, we talked a lot about love and different kinds of love um, and also attachment styles uh, and, and so on and so forth. And, and the, um, the most important kind of theme to emerge in this field is this idea that um, as human beings, we are highly, highly social as a, as a species. Uh, and this means that not only do we uh, prioritize and uh, derive um, a lot of happiness from having healthy relationships um, with our friends and family, uh, but we also um, are affected a lot in terms of our emotions by the quality of relationships at work. So uh, here are the uh, three domains and subdomains of belonging. So there is the co-worker belonging. This has to do with the belongingness uh, and connection with the people. And here, obviously, leaders and in particular, the boss is super important. Uh, peers are also very, very important. Obviously, they are, are you know, at the same level. And uh, we, we spend most time with our peers in organizations and um, also direct reports, right? So the extent to which our leaders trust us, the peers like us, 
and the direct reports respect us becomes very important. Uh, and I kind of covered a little bit of this even in the basic needs. Uh, the difference here is that uh, it's very important for us to feel um, respected by our leaders, to feel liked by our peers, and to feel trusted by our direct reports. Uh, and here in belonging, it's kind of the reverse in the sense that we want to trust our leaders. You know, it's very important that we, you know, it's an inside out perspective when it comes to belonging. How do we feel rather than how do we feel others feel about us? This is about how we feel. Um, these are kind of like two sides of the same coin, so to speak, but one of that is more basic, uh, whether we are liked, et cetera. And this one on belonging is, is a higher level. Um, so uh, at a basic level, it's necessary for us to feel liked. At a sufficient level of belonging, it is necessary for us to like um, the uh, co-workers that we have. Um, you know, this is a relatively subtle point and, uh, you know, I don't want to kind of like too much um, of a, you know, big deal out of it, but uh, essentially the idea here is that um, uh, our relationships at work with the other people at work is very, very important. Um, and uh, belonging is also manifested or, or is relevant in a couple of other domains. Um, so one of those is organizational belonging. Do we vibe with, are we aligned with the values of the organization? If, for example, you want to do good to the world, but you work for a cigarette manufacturer, right? You're going to have uh, some disconnect, some kind of um, um, unease, uh, some tension between who you are at a deep level and what you are doing for work or who you're working for, right? Likewise, uh, if you think about the vision of the organization, um, what does it want to do in, say, five years, 10 years? If you're a Tesla, for example, right, uh, you you want to be in the uh, high tech kind of space, um, uh, perhaps even explore the outer space, etc. Uh, and uh, you, as an individual working for Tesla, are not able to connect to those, and you're much more of a people person, or you're a person that's interested in spirituality or something like that. Then again, there's going to be a disconnect between the vision of the organization and what you feel is your purpose. And likewise, you know, the ways in which you want to contribute to the world, if it's misaligned with the ways in which the organization sees as contributing to the world. So the organizational belonging, in other words, is a super important domain of belonging. And the third domain is uh, physical space, right? So this is a little more mundane, a little more um, basic, uh, if you will. So uh, when you come into work, do you feel that uh, you can, uh, you, you, you feel that you're at home? Um, in the in the spaces that you find yourself in, um, not just in the overall layout of the uh, space. So rolling hall, for example, you know, I, I love it. It's beautiful. Uh, it's got, there's a lot of light coming in and it's uh, airy. Um, there's a lot of personal space around you, I feel. And um, the atrium is in particular beautiful because what they've done is they've uh, uh, staggered the staircases in such a way that um, it, it's not just one column of staircases. It's um, spread out a little bit. That gives it the, gives it this feeling of a little more airiness. Um, you're not, you know, closeted inside a um, stairwell when you're climbing up the staircases. Um, and uh, also, it promotes people to exercise a little bit, right? So, if there was a stairwell, most people would probably only take the elevators. But here in Rolling Hall, that's not the case. So. Uh, the design and the layout of the space becomes important, right? Uh, not just for the overall office, but also for the common spaces that we share, like, for example, the classrooms or um, the cafeteria. And of course, the personal space is hugely important. And this is one thing that's been evolving. Uh, as we talked about earlier, because of COVID, people are working from home. And so uh, some organizations, they have flexi um, spaces at work, right? So nobody gets a uh, assigned or very few people get an assigned uh, office uh, in a certain physical location in the building. Um, if you want a particular room, you have to come in early and block it and reserve it. And then you get that room kind of a thing. So there's flexi spaces, which take away this idea of ownership over the space. Uh, but I suppose they are more practical given that people are working from home a lot and you don't need one dedicated office space for every single employee kind of a thing, or even in just a cubicle, you don't need that. So maybe that's why some organizations are moving in that direction. But all of these um, are relevant for this uh, goal that we all have to have the sense of connection and belonging. And the idea is as a leader, you need to think that through. 
So what might you be able to do uh, in order to increase belonging? I already talked about shinier light events, right? In the context of autonomy. Um, but you could also do that in the context of, or think about it in the context of belonging. When you share what your interests are, what your hobbies are, how you spend your time, who your family is, uh, what your beliefs are, uh, et cetera, uh, you have a greater sense of uh, belonging with the people in the organization. You feel seen, right? And you also can see other people uh, in a uh, kind of uh, in a symbolic sense, and not obviously in a physical sense. We see people, but do we see who they are, what their values are, what their beliefs are, etc.? Um, of course, you know, sharing or allowing uh, employees to share their uh, uh, values and beliefs uh, might be somewhat of a risky strategy, right? Because you might have people with totally opposing views, and we see this a little bit in some of the university campuses right now, right? With uh, the war going on in Israel. Um, people pro-Israel uh, uh, versus pro-Palestine, uh, um, you know, might might kind of, you know, be at uh, a conflict, be in conflict. Uh, and, you know, there is a case to be made that maybe uh, we, we don't, as leaders, um, um, offer people the opportunity to uh, express who they are when it comes to those kinds of beliefs, uh, particularly in times when uh, emotions run high. But the... Um, General idea is that the more uh, we allow for people to be who they are, uh, we encourage diversity, we encourage um, people to, um, uh, uh, we, we, we make it comfortable for people to uh, showcase who they are and what their beliefs are, what their hobbies are, what their interests are, uh, the more will be the sense of belonging that people will have to the organization. Um, the uh, other thing that one can do here is to incentivize these so-called serendipitous interactions. Um, so I think I'd mentioned this, that Steve Jobs, um, one of the things that he famously did when uh, he uh, uh, was uh, part of the uh, committee that um, was um, providing inputs for the new Pixar building that was going to come up, this is more than 20 years ago, um, is that uh, he wanted the restrooms to be quite far away from the offices in which people sit, right? And the reason is that we visit the restroom, you know, four to five times um, during um, the work period, say from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. And uh, if you have to work all the way, walk all the way from your office to the restroom, right? And in the restrooms are deliberately placed far away from your offices. It just increases the chances that you're going to interact with other um, workers in the organization, right? And these serendipitous interactions go a long way toward um, encouraging uh, healthy relationships. You know, at the very least, you're going to see uh, people that you may not otherwise see if, you know, you can just walk around the corner to your uh, nearest restroom. Um, and just, you know, this this concept of, concept of mere familiarity, right? If you just uh, see somebody a lot of times, chances are higher that you're going to start to like them. There was actually a very clever study done in the context of classrooms where um, the researchers had this confederate that they had paid, uh, who wasn't an actual student in the classroom, but this uh, confederate was uh, hired or paid in order to come and sit in the classroom as if they were a student. And uh, over time, um, the uh, uh, teachers, uh, you know, who were also researchers, uh, uh, measured the other uh, students who were actual students their uh, evaluations of that confederate, right? And what they found is that over time, the other students ended up um, uh, evaluating this confederate uh, more positively. Um, and you know, the way that they did it is that they hit the objective of the study such that everyone evaluated everyone so that it wasn't kind of weird, why are we evaluating this one guy kind of a thing. Uh, and it wasn't evaluated on like, you know, creepy dimensions. It was more like, you know, we want to assess people's uh, personalities and perceptions of people's personalities. And so uh, periodically we'll give you a questionnaire where you have to evaluate uh, what you think of uh, some random other student in class. And um, it, what they found basically is that the um, confederates, uh, the evaluations, right, the perceptions of others of the confederate uh, became more positive. Um, and this confederate was um, instructed to not speak up, right, not say anything, not share anything. They merely showed up in class. And that was enough to uh, drive up the evaluation. So basically the point being that the more somebody becomes familiar, right? Uh, the higher the chance that we start liking them. And if you um, 
uh, encourage or incentivize serendipitous interactions where people meet other people by accident, quote unquote, by accident, even though you've designed the space to encourage those um, interactions, chances are higher that you're going to, uh, at the very least, like, if not actually engage in a conversation with and get to know these other people a little bit better at a deeper level and so on. All right, so uh, incentivize serendipitous interactions, shine your light events. Um, and the third thing you can do is allow employees to volunteer for a sh social cause on the company's uh, time uh, and money. And the idea here is that, um, you know, and this, uh, this, this particular recommendation has its roots in some very early classic studies by uh, a psychologist named Tajfel in the 1940s. And what Tajfel and his um, uh, co-investigators um, discovered is that one of the best ways to build a bond among people is to give them a common shared goal. And you see this in some movies, right? I mean, if you think about Independence Day, this, you know, uh, kind of uh, interesting movie that came out, I think, in the 1990s with Bill Smith, I believe he was in it, um, where there is a uh, outside, I, I, I want to say it was um, maybe a meteor or something that was going to strike the earth. And uh, so when you have this common enemy or a common goal, something that everybody can focus outward rather than focusing um, inward uh, at each other, um, then um, there is a sense of cohesiveness and sense of collaboration that automatically uh, is fostered um, by that external goal or external enemy. And so here the idea is that uh, when the employees all volunteer for a particular social cause, it may be something like, you know, let's clean up the city, right? Go out and pick garbage or let's um, try and feed uh, the homeless. Whatever it is, uh, if there's a common cause, then that brings the employees together. It binds the employees together. And the advantage of this, uh, you know, volunteering, volunteering for a social cause too, is that I'll talk a little bit about it when we talk about abundance culture in a moment. Um, it um, signals to the people in the organization that the organization is um, actually a caring um, entity, right? It really cares at a deeper level for the welfare of uh, society, welfare of other stakeholders who may not have a voice uh, in, in that particular society. So uh, when employees volunteer for a social cause, uh, there is an element of a what's called a giftivism bond that's formed among them. Um, and those giftivism bonds or ties are stronger than um, the work-related ties that we tend to have with um, our employees or our coworkers. Okay, so we've talked about uh, some things that you can do. Uh, here are some um, headlines that show that um, uh, this actually works, and uh, employees who volunteer together um, enjoy a boost in happiness, etc. Okay, so we are down to the very last of the five Bamba determinants of happiness in the workplace, and that is abundance culture. Here's um, the uh, figure, the domains and subdomains of uh, this particular uh, determinant. So uh, all the determinants of happiness at work that I've talked about obviously are very, very important. Um, but uh, this is perhaps the determinant that kind of percolates down to all the other determinants. Um, and this is the one determinant that um, most uh, people uh, working for the organization cannot do much about by themselves and really look up to the leaders. You know, this has to do with uh, the culture of the organization. Is it an abundance oriented culture? or is it a more scarcity-oriented culture? Um, so in an abundance-oriented culture, uh, the leaders have managed to foster this belief that we can all win, right? So this is not a zero-sum game, which is what a scarcity-oriented culture feels like, that my win has, go has to come at a cost to somebody else's win. Um, in an abundance-oriented culture, people feel that the pie can be grown, right? So everybody can win. Um, and so, uh, there is not as much of this element of, um, you know, for me to get promoted, uh, somebody else has to not get promoted. Or this idea that, you know, only one of us gets this award kind of a thing. Now, uh, before I kind of talk a little more about the uh, domains of uh, abundance orientation or culture, um, I have to kind of emphasize that, um, in fact, if you look at organizations, most organizations are... Um, you know, hierarchical, they, there's a pyramidical structure. There's one person at the very top, the CEO, and uh, fewer people in the, you know, upper top management. 
um, compared to when you go lower down in the organization. There's just more and more people at the entry level of the organization, and that gets whittled down, right? So in fact, there is a scarcity constraint, you might say, um, that organizations face. Um, but there are certain things that uh, leaders can still do uh, in order to mitigate that sense of scarcity orientation and promote a sense of abundance. Um, and so this is where the three domains come in. So in terms of employee treatment, um, how uh, employees are hired uh, says a lot about the culture of the organization. So uh, if uh, there is an intense focus on only um, skills and talents and aptitudes, as opposed to attitudes, um, that says a lot, right, about the organization. So Southwest Airlines, for example, I interviewed the um, vice president for culture there. Um, and uh, she told me that when they hire uh, people at Southwest, uh, they do focus a lot on whether uh, this person is uh, has got a good attitude, right? Is, is, is this person friendly? Even if they're hiring somebody for the back office, it's important for them that uh, the employee is going to be aligned with the values of the organization in terms of being compassionate and kind and giving and people oriented, right? And things might have changed over time with Southwest, uh, but uh, that's uh, a kind of a core driver, used to be at least uh, more so than perhaps now, of um, how they do things there. Okay. Um, another great example of this is uh, Zappos, um, and I'll maybe talk about Zappos a little bit later too, but um, this is the company that Tony Shea. Uh, started, unfortunately, he passed away a couple of years ago. Uh, but one of the things that he had as a policy when he hired people is that um, within the first week of hiring, if you wanted to quit Zappos, uh, you could um, earn a bonus. You could get $2,000 for merely quitting Zappos. So imagine that you got into Zappos and uh, you also got another job, right? Uh, as an entry-level person, um, you could quit Zappos and take up that other job and get a, you know, immediate boost of $2,000, right? Um, and what are they trying to do with that, right? So if you think about it, what they're trying to do is they're trying to drive away from the organization employees who are more money-minded. If money is a big motivator for you, more so than, you know, connections with people and um, being intrinsically motivated by the job or being, you know, seen as a person that um, is a Zappos employee, uh, you know, that identity is not that important to you, you might quit, Right. They want to make sure or increase the chances, I should say, of hiring people that are, are really keen to work at Zappos and uh, are aligned with the values of Zappos that had to do with happiness, for example. You know, happiness was huge at Zappos. So um, uh, employee treatment becomes important, in other words, for fostering a culture of abundance. Uh, likewise, on the other end of the, you know, the other side of it, which is firing, you know, how do you fire people, right? Sometimes it's an in an inevitable thing that you have to do, um, you know. Otherwise, you would not exist as a company. So you have to let go of people. You have shrunk. Your profits are down. Your revenues are down. Uh, how do you let go of people, right? Do you do your very best to retain them? Do the top management do they take a pay cut in order to um, uh, help retain a larger workforce, or is it a more kind of self-centered um, culture where you know people are let go? Um, uh, in a in a very uh, you know uh, very dismissive um, fashion, right? Uh, so that becomes important. If you've seen this movie Office Space, you know there are some very funny scenes around this um, uh, on how people are let go. Uh, in some of the better companies, uh, even if you're let go, uh, they do their best to at least place you in another organization or write you a great recommendation letter. And there's a lot of you know. Um, uh, uh, thought that goes into and and it's not taken easily this decision to fire uh, people in organizations that foster a culture of abundance um once you hire somebody you know how are people treated on an ongoing basis that becomes an important thing right so um is there a a, a sense of camaraderie among the um, employees of the organization are people significant milestones events celebrated like their birthdays and things like that um uh, when somebody accomplishes something, um, uh, uh, when a meeting starts, uh, do people take some time to appreciate what it is that they've done for the sake of other people? Uh, are people silent contributions, right? People might, in the organization, uh, not do uh, uh, some of the things that are, uh, you know, formally part of their job description, but yet uh, enhance the sense of um, 
belonging to the organization for other people. So for example, you might have some um, leaders um, who get to know the family members of um, uh, their employees, right? And then uh, invite them over to their homes for uh, lunches or dinners. And, you know, uh, in, in, the, in the process, also provide uh, feedback and encouragement uh, to these employees. And that's not required. But if that is happening in the organization, that's going to foster a culture of abundance. Um, the treatment of people are lower down uh, is very, very important. In really abundance-oriented organizations, um, there is a, a sense of taking care of the most junior people. So, um, you know, in your organization or in the organization that you worked, uh, think think back uh, to the organization. Um, did uh, the leaders uh, and the CEOs and the top management, did they have reserved parking spots, right? Did they, did they have their own set of restrooms that were uh, more uh, kind of premium restrooms, right? Uh, that were uh, reserved only for them and other employees lower down could not use them. Um, did they have bigger offices that were, you know, uh, in the corners and uh, had better views and everyone else had to, had to be in a cubicle in the center. So all of those kinds of things um, make the organization more vertical and hierarchical as opposed to flat um, and uh, more abundance oriented. So um, there's lots of ways in which an organization signals what its culture is. And a big part of it is uh, in the treatment of the employees. Uh, the treatment of other stakeholders also becomes important, right? That's the second big domain of customers. Are customers truly valued and are um, they, they see they seen uh, as uh, people that we want to serve or are they seen as uh, sources of revenue and profits, pure and simple, right? And so everything that's done uh, for them is done from the lens of, okay, what's going to maximize my profit? Um, so that becomes important. How are suppliers treated, right? Uh, do you kind of you know string them along when it's time for you to pay them or are you pretty uh, good about paying them on time? Uh, how's the community at large, the environment treated, right? So employees in the organization are like children at a home and the parents are the leaders, right? In this metaphor. And so when guests come in, these are the external stakeholders, the children observe how the parents treat those guests, right? Uh, after the guests leave, do the parents um, bad mouth these guests, right? So in an organization uh, that is scarcity oriented, uh, that happens a lot, right? So when a customer leaves, people make fun of the customer, right? Or figure out ways in which uh, they can extract even more money from the customer or they mistreat the suppliers, uh, particularly after the suppliers leave uh, the, or the premises of the organization. So um, we as workers um, uh, I definitely assess and pay attention to how our coworkers and especially our leaders treat these external stakeholders. And it tells us a lot about the culture of the organization. And last but not least uh, are the priorities of the organization. Um, is there an emphasis on the purpose of the organization? You know, what they're trying to achieve as opposed to the profits, right? So related to that, you know, is there a longer term focus, which is what happens in abundance oriented organizations or is it more of a, you know, let's kind of very quickly boost our profits for the next quarter, right? Um, and even if it comes at some detriment to longer term. Uh, likewise, intrinsic versus extrinsic rewards. This is an interesting thing, right? So if you think about um, one of the very popular kind of things that a lot of organizations do is to have these uh, extrinsic rewards, um, like for example, that you'll have an employee of the month award, right? So if you have a hundred people working in your team and you have one employee of the month, um, that employee is gonna feel happy that month and you have 99 losers, right, every month. And those are not gonna be very happy employees. Hang on just a minute, my dog's doing something weird. Hello? Sorry, he was just like dreaming and I think um, <laughs> uh, she was having a nightmare. Um, okay, so uh, in, in a kind of, it's, it's a kind of counterintuitive, but having a employee of the month award actually lowers um, the happiness of the, a team or the organization, even though you would think that it would promote the happiness in the long run, especially it would, you know, increase kind of healthy competition. And so that's the um, uh, kind of underlying logic behind uh, these employee of the month award kind of things. Uh, but in fact, um, if you kind of look at what happens, it turns out that it backfires. Uh, because like I said, you know, for every one winner every month, there is 99 losers who feel like 
uh, feel bad. Um, and then on top of that, um, what happens to that one winner is that the next month rolls around, he or she knows that they're not going to get the award again because, you know, typically rolls around. Uh, the organization wants to, I guess, justifiably motivate everyone, not just one person. And so that person slacks off a little bit uh, when they've already won the, won the award. And most important reason why these Employee of the Month awards backfire and fail is uh, because um, oftentimes we don't have a unambiguous winner, right, every month, particularly if you have a big, big team like 100 people, there's typically two, three, four, five people who have all done more or less equally well. And so you have to still choose one of them for, to be the winner. And so there's an element of politicking that goes on. There's an element of, you know, um, uh, puffing up your resume, um, you know, padding it up in some way or the other so that, you know, you kind of uh, increase your chances of winning, even though objectively speaking, you might have done a little bit less. And so those kinds of things happen. And um, the more you have that kind of a politicking and uh, the perception of politics uh, is perhaps even more important than whether it's actually happening or not. It vitiates the atmosphere and the culture of the organization. Okay, so what are the things that you can do? Um, so I already talked a little bit about Zappos, right? Incentivize scarcity oriented uh, people to quit. In other words, basically the principle being that you really want to hire people who are abundance oriented. And I think personally that, you know, skills and uh, aptitudes can be trained, uh, but people's values and personalities are going to be difficult to change. And so, um, you know, I'm not saying that you should hire somebody who's totally unskilled just because they are a great human being. But if you have two people who are more or less equal on skills, but one of them is definitely much better in terms of attitude and all that, um, even if they're somewhat a little bit lower on skills, I'd, you know, uh, consider hiring them uh, and making that a policy in the organization. Um, making intrinsic versus extrinsic recognition a uh, big part of the company culture, right? But not in a tacky way. I think it's very important to kind of uh, execute it well. Uh, but basically, if you have an organization in which uh, there is kind of verbal uh, recognition, symbolic recognition, doesn't have to be accompanied by money um, or by rewards. But for example, you know, if somebody does a really great job in their work, you know, giving them a, um, uh, a, a, uh, a little bit of time to go up and on stage and or or you know get a little bit of time in a meeting to talk about what it is that they did and why it is that they believe they were successful and some lessons that they learned from it uh, might actually be uh, more motivating for them than giving them a check for five thousand dollars right likewise maybe getting them to go attend a conference that they've always been interested in attending right uh, as the reward so it's more symbolic or it's not direct money um that might be a better way to motivate people. Um, people tend to compare when somebody gets money and things that are quantifiable, but when something is a little more symbolic, something's not directly money, uh, it's difficult to compare across people. And so uh, people don't feel as insecure or threatened or jealous um, or envious and uh, upset uh, when um, people have done well in the organization or reward in these more intrinsic ways rather than these extrinsic ways. And finally, uh, you know, consider promoting internal uh, corporate social responsibility. So allowing people in the organization to donate um, some time uh, for others in the organization that have a need. So Google comes here as an example. Um, so they have this policy where you, your accumulated vacation time can be donated to another employee who might be going through a bad patch, either because of a divorce or somebody um, in the family passed on and they need to go there to support um, the other members, uh, member of the family, things like that. Um, uh, likewise, uh, you know, uh, having schemes where you are um, uh, being generous or altruistic or um, supporting people within the organization. Uh, the organization takes care of the, you know, janitors, kids, education, for example, right? There is a fund to take care of that. That might go a much longer way in promoting this sense of abundance orientation within the organization than even uh, something that I mentioned earlier in the context of belonging, right? Which is to um, go and serve an external entity, um, do some social service or address a social cause uh, that's external to the organization. So the idea here is that charity begins at home and people observe how the 
family members, so to speak, in quotes, right? The people in the organization are treated, particularly the people who do not have access to as many resources. How does uh, the uh, leadership team treat those people who don't have a lot going for them? Um, signals a lot about the culture of the organization. All right. So that's all I had um, in terms of uh, providing an overview of the Bamba model. Um, and uh, again, you know, in summary, the idea here is that happiness of employees is hugely important, not just because, you know, we are emotional creatures and, you know, we all aim to lead a happy life, but also looking at it more from the bottom line's perspective, happier organizations are more profitable, right? So it completely makes sense. It's a win-win as a leader to focus and prioritize the happiness of your employees. The question is, how do we do it? So that's where the Bamba model comes in. And the Bamba model um, uh, suggests that, uh, and this is research backed obviously, that there are these five determinants of happiness at work, basic needs, autonomy, mastery, belonging, and abundance culture. And um, uh, there are a bunch of things that each of us can do uh, in order to promote the uh, happiness of our employees and coworkers uh, by kind of checking off each of these boxes, right? There's obviously a, thousand things that you can do under each of these five big determinants of happiness. I've tried to kind of break it down and give it a little more structure by um, uh, talking about or, or you know, structuring it along the domains and subdomains of each of these five determinants. I've only talked about three under each of the five determinants, but um, really, I mean, you can be creative and come up with many, many, many more. And the happiness simulation is kind of like an exercise in that, okay? So you're gonna see that there are six people reporting to you, each of them, has a reason to be unhappy. And uh, you have to first take time to understand the background uh, of each of these five or six people and why it is that they're unhappy. And then you'll be offered a menu of different things that you could potentially do. Some of the items that you can pick uh, in order to enhance happiness might actually apply to everyone, right? Even though you're targeting a particular person who's, who's, who's unhappy, um, uh, so, for example, uh, you you know that they're suffering from lack of autonomy and you want to make it uh, possible for them to work from home. And that might be a policy that you roll out to everyone in the organization. So a lot of other people, too, could potentially be affected by it, um, hopefully in a positive way. Um, and you're going to have to kind of discover whether, in fact, that action increases happiness overall for that person in particular who was uh, being targeted or uh, for the um, team as a whole, or it actually lowers happiness for people. And you'll be given reasons for why it is that it had one effect or the other effect. Um, and then, you know, you continue to take other actions based off of um, the um, situations um, uh, that, that describe uh, what other employees are going through and why it is that they're unhappy. And uh, you'll see there's a leaderboard on, um, the projector screen that shows uh, how each of the teams is performing as well, just to kind of like make it a little bit of a, uh, you know, gamify it a little bit, I should say. All right, so that's it from me. Thank you very much for uh, um, viewing this lecture and I will see you all on April 10th on Wednesday. Take care, bye.